I had a guy come into the shop yesterday. He was carjacked a couple days ago. He's terrified. Oh. He's like, I need a gun and I need training and I need it now. Mm-hmm. I'm like, dude, I can get you the training, but you can't get a gun until you get your Floyd card. Months. Months. Yeah. Right? And, and there's nothing you can do for him. Um, but we're live. Um, welcome, everyone, to another episode of Consciously Curious. Joining us today is Eric Tweed, owner and lead instructor of Archetype of the Gun. Um, Eric, I I took your class recently, I've, and then a private lesson after that, and I was I, I resonated very well with the your motto of like student for life, and the way that you teach us is not the way, but a way. Yep. Um, and I wanted to have you on to, to kind of like lean into like how you got to where you got. And especially we both share this EMS background. And mm-hmm. not only do you teach um, everything under the sun about firearms, but you have medical classes from mm-hmm. CPR to stop the bleed. And you are, I think, a lead instructor for if you wanted to open up your EMT class, like you, you could. I could. You could. I could. <laughs> you know, yeah, I could. Um, um, Eric, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Um, um the main theme of this episode, because you've done several episodes on, on firearms and firearm instruction, is I think my target audience might be curious, as curious as maybe I was, to taking an intro course or learning more about, about firearms. And I guess these days, have you noticed um, a certain demographic or a variety of demographic that are coming into your intro classes? Um. So... In the Chicagoland area, we're kind of unique. Yeah. Okay. Um, while we have a very, it's not incredibly large, but it's a respectable training community that um, are um, Second Amendment advocates mm-hmm. who enjoy the firearms lifestyle and train on a regular basis. Uh, we have a large number of our students that up until recently were anti-gun and still mm-hmm. um, to a extent are anti-gun. You know? Okay. Uh, uh, we get a lot of students that they are reacting to current events sure. and um, they finally see the need for it even though they don't agree with it. You know? Right. I want to have it just in case, but I don't like it. I hate the fact that I have to have it. I mean, and to an extent, too, if I could live in a world without guns, that'd be great, right? Yeah. But, you know, um, we, we're, we're getting a lot of students now that are um, formerly actively anti-gun that see the need for it. Right. right. Um, we have a lot of students that actually um, refer to them as closet gun owners, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. While they appreciate the Second Amendment and they agree with it, and they train on a regular basis, um, based upon their social circles and their work it'd, environments. It'd be frowned upon if they were to yeah. speak about it. Yeah, oh. they are. They, they are, unfortunately are in the closet because they don't want to risk their social circles and risk their jobs potentially. Um, so a lot of these people, you know, it's like, well, you know, I would love to leave you a review. But I can't, oh right? I don't. I don't want somebody to possibly see my name, and then, what are you doing with guns, right? Um, you know, a, a lot of them, you know, have questions about, well, how do I hide it from my friends and neighbors? Oh and, my goodness! Oh yeah, yeah. We have we have a lot of people that um, firearms don't align with who they are outside of the gun world. That's a shame because they and, can't be themselves. Yeah. <laughs> I, and it's an opportunity to answer other people's questions. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely it is. You know, but, you know, they don't talk about it with their friends. They don't talk about it outside of their immediate family. They don't talk about it at work. They don't do anything even remotely gun related on social media. Right. Uh, you know, they opt out of class photos. Oh, right. You know, right, right, right. Um, they are. And un- unfortunately, I was that way for a while, too. Mm-hmm. Um after I moved to Chicago, mm-hmm. 
because you know, when I moved to Chicago, we couldn't have handguns, right? Mm-hmm. That was in, you know, very early 2000s. And it wasn't until around 2010 that we could own handguns in Chicago. Um, so everything that I did with a handgun For didn't, sure. didn't exist. That because makes sense. I wasn't going to risk my city job with them finding out that I owned handguns. Right. Even though I didn't have them in the city, right. you know, I kept them at other locations outside of Cook County's house, at friend's house, at family's house, and I'd pick them up when I'd go take a class um, or when I wanted to shoot them. Uh, but firearm stuff on my social media, because I didn't, it was non existent because I didn't want to risk my city job. That's you interesting. Know? And after 2011 and, two, I mean, sorry, 2010, 2013, with, um, you know, the city being forced to allow us to own guns and then the passing of the Concealed Carry Act. I was like, all right, we're good to go. <laughs> Screw you guys, you can't stop me now. Um, yeah. You know, so uh, we, we get a lot of people that just... I understand. I, I've been can't. nonstop talking yeah. about it. <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, if there was an opportunity to, I think, I, I tell them, like, education was the way to to dispel any type of confusion or oh, yeah. fear of what this was. Oh, absolutely. You know, and the funny thing is, I mean, those, those students probably make up 50% of our, our student cool. base. Yeah. You know, the, the two that stood out in our class was the, the older couple, like mm-hmm. they look like they were in the seventies, but they, yep. they were very much into it. And, and they, <laughs> they, they enjoyed it a ton. I mean, they required a lot of extra work. Right. And you know, that's why we bring in AIs on large classes, but I mean, as much as they enjoyed it, never seen them again. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. And <laughs> that happens too. Yeah. You know, um, and, and they were smiling and had a good time and they enjoyed it. But I, 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 I'm fairly certain that they probably decided it as much as they wanted to do it, as much of a good time they had, it wasn't for them. Sure. Sure. But you don't know until you try. Well, exactly. Right. You know, right, right. Uh, they, they probably realized that it was more work than they wanted to put into it. Right. Okay. So, because, you know, like you, um, you know, led to in the beginning, you know, we don't teach the way, we teach a way because everybody's different. And the the whole firearms um, training community and uh, defending yourself with a firearm is a journey. It mm-hmm. is a nonstop journey with there, there is no destination. It's about the trip, right? Right. right. Um, Very much so. If you don't use it, you lose it. Uh, not so much, uh, there are people out there that will tell you that shooting is a perishable skill. Okay. Um, and, and that's not, I mean, words mean things and, and that's not exactly correct. Okay. Um, if you learn how to do it and you have, and understand the safety aspects, you don't forget that's how true. to use a gun, just like you don't forget how to ride a bicycle. It is a diminishable skill. So if you don't do it for a period of time, you're not going to be as good as you were previously. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in, in some instances that, that will show up in as little as two weeks without doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, shooting at a high level, I see a difference in my abilities. If I've been shooting a lot and then I take two weeks off or something and don't touch a gun, I'm still performing at a very high level in a lot of people's eyes, but I'm not performing as good as I was two weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, that makes sense. Sure. You know, uh, and, and that's part of why we, treat this like a martial art it's a continuous journey um because you know the the time comes when you need to use your gun with injuries stress adrenaline Mm -hmm. environmental factors all that stuff you're going to default to your lowest level of training right yeah you know so If you've only taken one class and you need to use your gun for self-defense, uh, you're relying on luck. Right. Right. right, right. Um, I used to make the joke with that before I was married and had kids, you know, I won't gamble with my money, but I got no problem gambling with my life. Uh, that's not the case anymore. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. you know, and when it comes to firearms, um, it, it very much is something that needs to be constantly worked on. I mean, even if it's just 50 rounds once a month, just right, to right. maintain a familiarity with it. Right. Right. Um, but it's always going to be better if you train on a regular basis and practice on a regular basis. Yeah, for sure. Right. I mean, I, 
you know, I've gotten awards for when I played piano and when I was, when I was a musician, you know, I was, you know, practicing for 30 hours a week. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, besides doing, you know, music in school, you know, I was doing, you know, private piano lessons, doing private, you know, horn lessons on top of my practice and then add that on to the extracurricular stuff, put me in front of a sheet music. Now I haven't, you know, I still know where the keys are, but I can't perform at a high level on the piano. Cause I haven't, I don't, I haven't forgotten how to do it. I mm -hmm. just can't do it as well as I used to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that makes sense. I agree. Yeah. Um, I want to know more about how you got to where you got. Like, did you think you'd be here? When, Absolutely not. When high school or co college? Like, what did you think you'd be Absolutely doing? Absolutely not. Did you think about career things like back in the day? Um, everything that I've done in my life as a professional career, I fell into. Uh, Same. They, they, they were happy accidents, right? Right. That worked out well. Um, man, when I was in high school, I was convinced that uh, I was going to play music for professionally. Okay. And I was at that level, right? Um, I was actually got a full ride scholarship to uh, Eastern Illinois as a performance major on French horn with a uh, minor in education. That's wild. <laughs> right? And two weeks before I was supposed to start classes, there was a shakeup in the program and I couldn't go. What? So it wasn't even because of you? So, no, it, it wasn't. So what, what happened was... Um, just a weird story. Um, the director that gave me my full ride scholarship, and I came from a family of five kids, so I needed that full ride scholarship. Sure. Um, found out he was getting terminated. Oh. What? And his attitude was because he had tenure too, and I don't know what happened, but did he just give out all these? He 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 gave <laughs> out a bunch of full ride scholarships that the program couldn't afford. Gotcha. So when the school found out, oh no, I'm like, oh. wait a minute. It, myself and like eight other people had their full ride scholarships pulled, right? Um, I was 18 years old, and I had stayed home from a family vacation to drive myself to school. Uh, you know, knowing what I know now, I've been like, sorry, I signed the papers. I'm enrolled in classes. <laughs> I got my dorm assignment. Um, yeah, you got you were, you that, were knee deep in it. Yeah. Um, that's a you problem. That's not a me problem, right? <laughs> Knowing what I know now. Right. Um, you know, but when I was 18 with my family out in the middle of the desert and, you know, uh, you know. So that you were alone and you were ready I, to go to school. Yeah, I was alone gotcha. at home. I was locking up the house because wow. they were. That's how you found out. Yeah, they were out in like Arizona or something like that or Utah. Oh my goodness. And they were in the middle of the desert and, you know, so no way to contact them, right? Um, except for at the hotel. Um, I'm like, well, shit, now what do I do? I'm supposed to start school in two weeks. Uh, so I, I just started enrolling in um, classes at the community college. Um, I saw they had an EMT program, and I'm like, hey, I liked doing that stuff when I was in the Boy Scouts. Mm. Um, I took the EMT class, and I passed it yeah. kind, of, kind of falling asleep, right? It was a pretty easy class <laughs> did, for me. Did that let you know that this could be something that you would do for— Oh, yeah. No, it, right. Absolutely. I, I took that first EMT class, and while it was a breeze for me to pass— I fell in love. Good. Right. And, and then, um, you know, on to intermediate, on to paramedics, started working, you know, in ERs and on ambulances. And, you know, my, my EMS career just took off. Sure. I'm like, I, mean, I love it. I'm making decent money and, you know, uh, I'm happy doing it. Yeah. Um, so I, I've been doing that for. How did, how did you land in Chicago? Uh, so I was working in Springfield okay. and, um, two of the nurses that I work with said, Hey, we got a traveling gig. We want you to come with us on. And it's up in Rockford. Um, uh, they're going to pay for our housing. Uh, you're getting like a $10 raise and it was six days on eight days off. Oh, so wow. for what? Eight, 12, 10, uh, 12 hour shifts, seven P to seven A. And oh. I, I got a lot of uh, uh, autonomy there <laughs> okay. um, because there, I was I smarter mean, than your average. Staff, and yeah. you were smarter, yeah. Yeah, I was smarter than your average bear, you know, sure. not to toot my own horn. But they're like, all right, Eric, we're short nurses. Go run go run the immediate care. Go run the fast track. You know, all the, you know, simple stuff. And whatever you need, just bring me the chart and I'll sign it. 
you know, um, it, it, was, it was funny because, all right, Eric, we're short staffed. Uh, there's supposed to be, you know, two medics and two nurses in on a trauma. And this was at a level one trauma center. All right, well, sorry, Eric, the ER slammed. We got, you know, 30 people in the waiting room and we got three traumas going on. Guess what? It's just you and the trauma surgeon. Did, did you, <laughs> Here's did you, the access to the drugs. <laughs> what was your perspective on that? Because especially with like the whole Redonda thing right now, you're just, if anything were to go wrong, the blame would be falling. You. Oh, oh, absolutely. Well, <laughs> did you ever, do you ever consider that? Or you're like, oh, so I have more. Yes and no. Right. Cause I was never the one I was doing the stuff, but I was never the one signing the charts because that would have been illegal. Cause I was operating outside of my scope of practice. And I can talk about that now, Yeah. but it's like, Hey, you, this is the only option we have. We trust you. Just bring the paperwork to me to sign. And we were, and we were Man. still on paper charts back then. So, you know, uh, it's just me and a trauma surgeon there. And it's like, all right, Eric, we got to sew this guy up. I'll start on the head. You start on the feet. Right. And it was, I, I got so much experience. That's always back in the day. It was, I learned so much yeah. being fed to the wolves and all right, time to perform. Um, and, you know, from there, uh, I got headhunted by a superior ambulance here. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of the, you know, their crews came to Rockford Memorial when I worked there and they, uh, Hey, you know, we'd like you to come interview for a job. I show up for the interview and I, I walk in like, all right, you need to fill out this application. And, uh, the, my, my old boss came down. She's like, what are you doing? I'm like, well, they told me I had to fill out an application. Hey, Eric, you already got the job. Come on up. We're doing orientation. I'm like, Oh, Okay. Uh, um, so I started doing critical care transport out in Elmhurst for superior ambulance. Um, because, uh, and the move up here actually before that, um, I actually had to stay up in Rockford cause I dislocated my knee pretty That's a bad. Hike, yeah. Um, so I was up here for physical therapy for, oh. for, for three months. So I actually moved up here for three months from Rockford to this area from Springfield to Rockford. Oh, okay. And then, uh, while living in Rockford, you know, I started working at Superior, so I was commuting from yeah, that's Rockford to Elmhurst. Oh, I was, I was 22, 23 years old, and I had a Ducati, man. Oh, Straight okay. down the 90 really? at 140 <laughs> miles per hour, and it was a short commute. Because, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, 90 is not the name of the road. It's the minimum speed limit, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> and I was on a crotch rocket, so I'd just zip along, and I made that commute nothing. Uh, but... I never really, I had friends in Rockford, but I never really fit in. Right. Sure. You know, um, if I wasn't with my group of friends from the hospital, I didn't get out, invited out to do stuff. Um, whereas when I went to, when I started working at Superior, I was getting invited oh, out sure, and I made sure. friends real easily there in, in, you know, and I had a lot of friends at Rockford, but it was just easier yeah. uh, here. So I'm like, all right, screw it. I'm moving to the city. Uh, and then I am like, well, I'm living in the city. Yeah. What the hell? Let's put my name on the list for the fire department. Mm. And actually I got called like six months later after I put my name on the list, that's, which is unheard of these bad, days. Yeah. Um, so I worked at superior ambulance doing critical care and on the fire department, um, about 2005 when I got on there. And then in 2014, I went off the job permanently after, uh, mm. three rotator cuff tears, two labrum tears, bicep tendon tear. Uh, so I was pretty much useless on the street. So did you see that coming? Uh, During your tenure on the fire department? No. Well, uh, I knew it was a very rough job physically. Uh, most paramedics that retire from the city of Chicago are damn near crippled. What's, um, the, what's the movement? Is it the stair chairing? Is it, uh, it's is it? just the constant abuse. It's the constant abuse. You know, you're doing 30 runs a day. And I spent my time on the busiest ambulances in, in the city of Chicago on the south side and west side. Mm -hmm. Um so 30 runs was normal. Uh, when I finally ended up on a rig that was doing 18, 20 calls a day, I was like, holy hell, I'm in retirement. Um, <laughs> you know, but it's just that, you know, you're doing 30 calls a day. Um, you're, you're carrying 300, 400 pound patients down narrow stair, you know, down narrow uh, spiral staircases doing, yeah. you know, uh, constant abuse. So my, my body was taking a, taking a beating, but um, all of my... Um, shoulder injuries actually, um, from lifting patients. Yeah. Um, my first one we didn't know about, um, until after the fact, uh, I was wrestling a PCP patient, um, who was actively trying to kill his girlfriend and he ended up biting off part of my thumb. 
Oh my goodness. Okay, yeah, I can show you pictures. Oh it's, man. Uh, he bit straight through my t- thumb. Um, you know, so that was a whole ordeal. And I went off just thinking that my thumb was the only injury. I come back to work after my thumb had healed. And within two weeks, I had torn my rotator cuff. Wow. It was torn before. We just didn't know about it because sure. we were focused on the other injury. Um, so that was my first rotator cuff tear, you know, did surgery and all that stuff and came back. Uh, about a year or two later, I tore it again. Mm-hmm. Um, I forget if that was either lifting a, I think I was taking a patient out on the cot. Um, at, at, at this point, like with a, after a few injuries, were you thinking of making the transfer to the fireside or uh, so other alternatives? I never really wanted to be a firefighter. Same. <laughs> right? Um, it was always one of those things, well, if I have to be on a fire department to do EMS and get paid well, I will. But my passion was always with the medicine. Okay, yeah. My passion was always with the medicine. Um, but it's kind of like when I ah, I live in the city, I might as well put my name on the fire list and just see what happens. Uh, I put my name on the, you know, I got hired as a medic. Um, and then I, I'll put my name on the fire list. The funny thing is, uh, I honestly think that, you know, I don't know what people's feelings are about, you know, higher powers, but I honestly feel that somebody out there didn't want me to be on the fire side mm. because every time they called me for the fire side, I was off with a rotator cuff tear. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. You know, they'd call me for processing and then a month yeah. later, I'm on medical with a torn rotator cuff again. Gotcha. And I'd go back and they'd put me back on the list. And I'd get called again. Multiple opportunities. And then, <laughs> you know, three months later, another rotator. And I'm like, well, oh, shit. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't be on the fire side, right? Um, but yeah, so I, uh, you know, had all those tears and I retired from there. And then uh, I started, well, I'm a, I'm a medic, you know, but I had uh, restrictions for my duty disability. You know, there's certain things I couldn't do. So I couldn't go work at privates. Right. Okay. Uh, so I started working in doctor's office. I worked at DuPage medical group, immediate care, uh, which is essentially a standalone emergency room without trauma. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, we had all the cardiac drugs, intubation, we did procedures, you know, um, so it wasn't your average band aid box. Uh, so I worked there for quite a while. Um, left there, um, Got bored, started working at Cabela's as a gun bunny, and I've always been doing this gun stuff. This entire time, this entire stuff, been I've been on the doing side, gun this stuff. Is, has, this has been something that you've been interested in and, and passionate yeah. about this entire time. Oh, yeah, this entire time. Gun stuff has okay. always been part of that, right? And, okay. you know, hey, Eric, can you help me come do this? Or, Eric, can you help me build this gun? You know, guns were always part of it. I wasn't formally teaching, um, you know, but it was always present. Yeah. Uh, and then... Uh, when I was working at DuPage Medical Care, uh, one of my buddies said, hey, Eric, I have a friend that has a firearms training company. He needs some help. Um, you're good at this. Why don't you give him a call? Mm. So uh, I got hooked up with, and actually he was a paramedic too, funny nice. funny enough. Um, I started teaching for him as an AI. I did my... Uh, for uh, associate instructor or alternative? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, um, you said it earlier. Yeah. That's what I was uh, adjunct instructor, adjunct. Okay, okay. Uh, associate instructor, gotcha, gotcha. you know, um, sure. what, whatever, assistant instructor, whatever you call it, yeah. same thing, AI. Uh, you know, working next to him um, for free. I was that was my two year. I call it my two year internship. You know, learning the trade. Yeah. Um, he shut down business up here, moved to Florida, and I'm like, man, I really liked that. Okay. Uh, so I'm like, maybe I should start my own company. And I started getting my, uh, you know, official certs to start teaching for all my insurance requirements and stuff like that. And, um, you know, while I was starting to do that, mostly just word of mouth, private stuff, because, you know, it's one thing when people say, here, I'll, I'll give you, a, you know, a hundred bucks to spend some time on the range with me to, all right, I want to, you know, do you take credit cards? Do you take checks right yeah. now i got a paper tra- taxes, now yeah. i got a paper trail and gotta pay taxes and now i gotta get insurance, <laughs> insurance right yeah, yeah, yeah. so if i'm gonna do it i'm gonna do it right um so i was working at gun at cabela's uh being a gun bunny you know uh, i was there to look pretty and and, and move guns mm. right um do they what, when you say that like do they hire because i've never been to cabela's do they just hire anyone or like what does um, that mean and without it's ta- a retail without shop shit about Cabela's. It's like it's like a retail. Anyone can. Okay. It's a retail shop. If you have your FOID card, you can work there. They don't require any sort of base knowledge. You just have to have your FOID card. So and they a want lot, you to sell this stuff. Yeah. Like, oh. Well, they do in-house training, but okay, it's okay. funny. Even after all the in-house training, it was like compared to dude, you shouldn't be talking about that because you don't know what you're saying. You're gonna get someone in trouble. Um, 
we actually had a really good crew when I was there. Okay. Um, and I keep in contact with a lot of those guys, and a lot of those guys are actually returned students of mine. They come back all the time okay. uh, and take classes. Um, and, you know, I left there, and, you know, the, the training business kind of took off. You is know. it because you you started getting more demand for your instruction? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I is that that's about about two thousand and I think it was two thousand seventeen. Okay. Um, that I uh, officially started the company and started paying taxes and you know, I was still all word of mouth. I'd do like three four open enrollment classes a year, but it was all mostly privates. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and it just started growing and growing and growing. Now we're doing eight classes a month. You have what, and, three locations. Uh. I, so I teach you, at three locations. You teach at three locations. Okay. Uh, this is my home base, Shore gotcha. Galleries. Uh, this is where my office is. This is where I do eight classes a month. Uh, I also teach down at the compound in Crete, and uh, I have the ability to teach out at Aurora Sportsman's Club in mm -hmm. Waterman. I just haven't really taught any classes out there recently. Uh, it's, uh, it's just scheduling. The, the new website looks good. You know, um, <laughs> but I those are the three options, and then we actually have a, a, a new range um that my friends at Devad Defense set up mm. uh, and said that I can use their range too. So I can now teach uh, here, Aurora Sportsman's Club, uh, the compound in Lake Geneva. Wow. You know, depending on what class we're doing and stuff like that. So, um, Do you see a difference in demographic at each location? No, it's all it's all the same. Nice. It's all the same. Okay. Um, the two-day classes generally get your more hardcore students. Okay. Um, we do get some like new students two eight in hour there. Courses. Uh, yeah, two eight-hour days. Wow. Two eight-hour days. Um, and that's a lot for some people. Sure. Right? Um, so the people that come to those classes are a little bit more dedicated. Yeah. Um, because they're willing to put up with that punishment for two days. Um other people, and that's one of the reasons why I started doing my four-hour clinics here is because I, I realized that we're neglecting a significant portion of the gun-owning community for those people that don't have the interest to take two-day classes, don't have the ability financially, don't have the ability to take time off of work. You know, so I started doing the two-day classes and in, in broke down into four-hour formats and breaking it down into bite-sized chunks. Nice. $150, four hours, guys, like you know, four, four hour sessions. Yeah. You know, nice. and you, you know, um, and you know, you get certs for those and, um, you can, if you want, uh, we're, we're now starting to issue certs for the clinics. We didn't in the, in the beginning, but I'm sorry, breaking stuff down into bite sized chunks. And that really took off. People liked that. Yeah. Um, was it like a different demographic that you started seeing it, 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 those now we had those dedicated students that, we see it two day classes. That they can sit for eight hours and, and, and take they, it. Right? They sit for those two day classes, um, but they really like those guys. Really like the four hour because oh. it was cheap at one hundred and fifty for four hours. Um, it was easy for them to pop into a four hour class and and get a tune up or get some trigger time under the eye of an instructor. Um, but then we have a significant amount of the population who's never been to a two-day class and will never go to a two-day class because they don't have the desire or the ability to. Um, but they take four-hour classes, you know, like you wouldn't believe. So they're still getting the, cool. the, the education. Yeah. And now all these people that used to be neglected are receiving high-quality firearms training. Yeah. Right. They're, they're receiving what other people would do in two day classes and travel cross country to take, but they're now can take it local. You know, they pop in after work mm -hmm. um, or they come in on the weekend. They're not they're not giving up their entire weekend. Yeah. Yeah. We know. You know so. so like with with the EMT program, it's like usually it's university students coming from mm -hmm. class or between classes. But then you also have people that have full time jobs and they need a night class um, yep. and they can't commit more than three, four hours. So exactly. It's nice. You're you're I, so. I've we've been noticing a different demographic when we open up our, our time yeah. slots to that. Yep. Um, it's more convenient for people. It's more accessible. Yeah. Yeah. So what qualifies someone to be not only just an instructor, because I'm sure there are bare minimums, but um, what should someone be looking for it, when, when they're looking for an instructor? Because because you you guys, you and Dan, you. Yeah. You rattled off a bunch of names that, to me, were unfamiliar with, yes. like Dave Spaulding and, and so on and so forth. Yep. Like, so how can someone gauge what a good to mediocre to bad instructor is? So 
it's a double-edged sword with the firearms industry, all right? Um, we have our Second Amendment rights, and there is no real structure or government oversight mm -hmm. because some a lot of people would see that as an infringement. Sure. Okay, because... Anybody can do it, right? So, but but the community has acknowledged that there are bad instructors. Right? There are okay, absolutely there okay. are bad instructors, um, and a lot of these people, you know, can with no background in education or no real background in, in, in firearms training, uh, can take one course, you know, one eight hour course, and hang up their shingle as a firearms instructor with is that, is with that no the basis NRA or is that. Uh, NRA um, and some other places out there. There are other um, okay. entities that will certify you as a firearms instructor, but there's no prerequisite to get in. Okay. okay. There, there is no minimum standard. So as long as you show up and don't have any major safety violations and you have a basic level of marksmanship, mm. you're qualified to teach. Mm. You know, and, and that's not a bad thing for basic safety and basic instruction of, okay, this is a gun. This is how you handle a gun safety. This is how you use the sights, right? This yeah. is how you hit a target, right, uh, at, at a bare minimum level. Um, anybody can do that. Mm -hmm. And when you s go into that and just take that one class and you have no basis for it, um, you, you send, tend to see people... Um, Oh well, I can make money at this. I need to offer more classes, so they start mimicking what they see on the internet poorly. Mm. And unfortunately, the internet's full of terrible information. Uh, the the great thing about the uh, internet is it gives people access to information. It gives everyone a voice. Uh, the other problem with the internet is it gives any asshole with an opinion a voice, whether it is a good opinion or bad opinion, right? Um, so, um, on, on the low end of things you have to be careful about your instructor. So you should kind of know what their background is before you sign up for a class. So you know what your number one, you're spending your money on ammo's mm -hmm. not cheap these days. Mm -hmm. uh, and in all honesty, you're putting your life in these guys' hands because uh, this is one of the things that the anti-gun left gets right is guns are dangerous. Mm -hmm. If they weren't dangerous, I wouldn't carry it for self-defense. Mm. Um, you know, so you get, you know, a uh, a low base level of education teaching to people with no experience, they don't know any better. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and that gets kind of messy. Uh, there are other things that we look for in instructors. You know, military experience and police experience is fine, but having that experience doesn't automatically make you a good instructor. Okay, well, I've carried a gun for 30 years. Okay, when's the last class you took? Mm. Oh, I haven't taken a class since, you know, I went through the academy 40 years ago. Yeah, in, in one of the previous episodes, you said that civilian instructors have more skin in the game. They, they do. Right, and, and you're always staying up to date uh, on taking more courses yourself. We, we don't technically have that pedigree that just a lot of that influx of students new students look for like oh this guy's military he knows what he's doing this guy's a cop he knows what he's doing and there's a lot of good law enforcement and military trainers out there and i work with a bunch of those dudes and they're excellent instructors but they're mm -hmm. teachers they're not just some okay well i retired and now i need to mm. you know pad my sure. pension fund right yeah, yeah. um there's a lot of quality instructors out there but for and this goes for the civilian side too I mean, for every good instructor, there's probably 10 bad instructors. Okay. Okay. Um, on my end, you know, yes, I've got the NRA instructor certs. I've got instructor certs from the United States Concealed Carry Association, USCCA. And those are kind of the base minimum that, uh, the bare minimum that people look for because they're popular organizations. Um, I also am a range master instructor under Tom Givens. Mm -hmm. uh, Tom Givens is the gold standard for civilian firearms training. Mm -hmm. uh, his business is making new instructors because he had a problem with what he saw in the training industry. Okay, It's like, man, you guys don't know 
what you're doing. You don't know what you don't know. Uh, and I'm going to set out to fix that. Uh, Tom Givens, for a long time, owned one of the largest indoor facilities in the United States uh, down in Memphis, Tennessee. He got tired of the retail side and running a range and all that stuff. And he retired and just focused on the training. And, and his primary business is making new instructors. Um, is he still around? Is he oh, still yeah. Teaching? Oh, yeah. He's okay. still teaching. Um, now, he's he's getting up there. I think Tom's in, I think is in yeah, his early you, 70s. You also mentioned that of like learning from from the, from the old guard. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. As long as what they're teaching stays relevant. There are some instructors yeah. that have been teaching forever, that but they haven't changed anything adapt, from yeah. the 70s. And, well, shooting firearms is, we've gotten a lot better at it. We know a lot more now. Sure. So what you knew in the 70s might not be pertinent today. Um, you know, but um, unlike the NRA and USCCA, Tom Givens' instructor course is not a give me. It's not a pay to play thing. Gotcha. He's got a 30% fail rate. Okay. Um, and he has, all right, man, if you're enrolling for this class, you have to have at least this amount of experience. Wow. Okay. Like what? Like if you were uh, off the top of your head, like if, you know, just X amount of classes in, you know, whatever discipline you're trying to get your, cause you know, he does, um, he has multiple levels of handgun certification. He's got shotgun certifications, stuff like that. Right. So if you're going to take a handgun course, uh, instructor course from him, you better be able to perform with a hand. It's got to tell you. So when right? you say when you say certification, is it a Tom Tom Given certification? Yes, it's a Tom. You get Givens so good that you can even just not give out your own certificate. Yes, holy moly! Um, and anybody can give out a certificate, right? Right, right, right. And anybody can say, "Well, I made an instructor," but Tom Givens is one of those guys who's been around forever, and his standards and the caliber of instructors that he puts out has become the gold standard mm. for civilian firearms trainers. And, and even... Does he keep tabs? On oh, absolutely. His instructors? Absolutely. Okay. It is a very close-knit group. And he'll yank your certification. Wow. It's if, stuff like that. Yeah. That, yeah. He'll okay. yank your certification if he it's hears follow you. follow-up. Yeah. Yeah. He'll, he'll yank it if you're doing something stupid, unsafe, or doing something that reflects on the training community poorly. Um, but to get his instructor cert... Uh, after your introductions on day one and your safety brief, you go out and you shoot the FBI qualification cold and you're expected to pass it at an instructor level. Oh, wow. So day one, no warm up. you got to shoot at the same level as FBI instructors. Oh, wow. Okay? Yeah, there's a standard. Yeah, there's a standard, oh, right? Okay. Uh, you got to pass that test twice. After you pass that test, you got to pass the range master instructor qualification, which... Was that something under Tom Givens? Yeah. Right, range master. Yeah, range okay. master. That's okay. Tom Givens. Sorry. Gotcha. Um, and Tom based his range master instructor qualification off the FBI. Okay. But um, he made it harder, mm. right? Uh, on the FBI's target, it is what we call a Q target. It's essentially from the waist up to the head with no arms. Looks like a giant bowling pin. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty much anywhere inside of that target counts as a hit. Mm. Uh, Tom reduced the size of the target. It's still on a Q target, but there's an 8-inch circle on the chest and a 4-inch circle on the head. All your hits have to be in those areas. Wow. Okay. Where the important stuff is to stop a fight. Right. Yeah. Um, so he has a higher level of accuracy. He increased the difficulty of the skills and, you know, uh, made the time limits a little bit harder. And he, so the instructor certification is significant. The instructor qualification. Yeah. Uh, the range master one is significantly harder than the FBI one. Yeah. That's awesome. You know, because with the FBI one, uh, the instructor level is, it's the same test. You just have to score higher on it. Yeah. Right? Uh, and after that, you have to take a written test. Uh, when I took it, it was about 88 questions. Sure. Um, and he's constantly evaluating this program and changing it, right? Updating the shooting qualifications, updating and lengthening the written test. And it wasn't a fill in the blank. I mean, sorry, it wasn't a multiple choice test. Right. It was, wow. fill, it was it's, it's primarily fill in the blank. Really? Right? Um, <laughs> and Tom is a stickler for standards, and he has high standards. So if you get, if you answer the question, correct, you got the point across, but something is slightly out of order or you use the wrong verbiage, mm. the answer is wrong. He doesn't care if you got the point across because, well, Standards are there for a reason, and words mean things. And we develop these processes because they work. So you have to pass all three of those tests wow. 
to get his instructor cert. And he's got a 30% fail rate. 30% of the people that show up to his instructor qualification fail. Um, and then uh, I'm a handgun combatives instructor under Dave Spaulding. Uh, Dave Spaulding, like Tom Givens, is one of the old guard. Uh, when those two dudes start talking, pretty much everyone shuts up and starts listening. Um, what is that? And handgun combatives? Handgun is that com- close comp? Like- well, handgun combatives is Dave Spaulding's company. Uh, but like, what does that even mean? What does that entail? He's teaching you how to fight with a handgun. Wow. Like close quarters. Uh, and everything in between. Uh, if you ask me yeah. and other instructors out there, I consider 25 yards close quarters. Oh, oh okay, okay. Okay. And, and the reason why I consider 25 yards close quarters fighting, any asshole with a gun at 25 yards can just index the gun, mm-hmm. put the black thing on the, on the target, and start hammering that trigger and do a, a mag dump. Mm. And if they've got a 15 round magazine, they're going to get lucky and hit you five or six times. Sure. Right. So at 25 yards, I need to have the ability to draw my gun and quickly and accurately place effective fire on target. Gotcha. Okay. So at 25 yards from the holster, bang, I I need to get a center mass hit and hit something vital to stop that threat because I need to finish that fight before he gets lucky and hits me. So, would you say that these two courses under Dave Spaulding and Tom Givens mm-hmm. would be, for in your standard, the other minimums if to you, make a good instructor? If you ask me, the minimum to make a good instructor should be the range master instructor qualification. Oh, okay, okay, gotcha. If you ask me, that's the minimum. Okay, and he's the gold standard in the in the training world for a reason. Gotcha. Um, Dave, you're you're not, and you're not gonna, but you're not gonna see any more from Dave Spaulding. Uh, Tom Givens is in the business of making instructors. Uh, Dave Spaulding is not. Hmm. Uh, Dave Spaulding announced his retirement. He's now technically retired. Hmm. Uh, and a bunch of us and, and all of his alumni are like, Dave, please don't go. Uh, your, your, your stuff is... He said, was it his like third retirement? Yeah, it's like his third <laughs> retirement. He, he went from local cop in Ohio to working for the federal government and then opened up his training company. So he's had three careers. Um, uh, but he's not in the business of making instructors. Okay. Um, we were able to goat him into doing a one-time instructor certification course just so we could keep his techniques alive. Um, what we didn't know is was he was kind of going to hand this company over to us. Oh. I'm archetype of the gun. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. Uh, I'm allowed to teach Dave's programs. Oh. Under his name, you get a handgun combative certificate signed by me, signed by Dave. Oh, wow. Um, and it's out of Dave's brain, from Dave's brain, out of my mouth to you, right? Um, and the diff- and we didn't know he was going to do that. But his standards were, in a way, even higher than Tom Givens. Uh, if you don't pass Tom Givens' class, he's not going to kick you out of class mm. unless there's something dangerous mm. um, or you're just an asshole. Um you're allowed to finish class, even if you f- don't pass the tests, right? Mm-hmm. You're allowed to finish, but you're just not going to get certified. Um, two things that Dave had, uh, Dave demanded not only the ability to teach and understand what you're teaching, yeah. uh, he demanded a mastery of his curriculums. Okay. 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 You had to teach it just like he taught it. Yeah. Right? Uh, you had to, and... That's a hard thing to do. I mean, the man's been doing this forever. And he's got a great program. Um, so if you didn't teach it up to his standards the way he likes it taught, you're gone. Mm. And, and he, he'd kick you out in the middle of class. Here's your money back. Go away. I'm done with you. Um, because it's a legacy thing for Dave. He didn't do the instructor program to make new instructors and make money. He did it as a legacy issue. It keeps his information alive yeah. and well, and okay. you're representing him every time you well, do it absolutely yeah absolutely um so why those guys instructor certs are, are kind of important and, and this is kind of my six degrees of kevin bacon right they're they're two they're two of my mentors and they're two of the instructor certs that i have um but they both grew up under colonel jeff cooper mm. colonel jeff cooper um is the founding father of modern firearms training for civilians. Okay. Uh, back in the 70s, Colonel Jeff Cooper um, realized that there was 
no place for the average person to get firearms training mm. unless they got generational knowledge passed down from family members, which a lot of times is questionable. <laughs> um, join the police department or join the military. Sure. Uh, and he had a problem with that. So he opened up what uh, was known as the American Pistol Institute, API, out in Arizona in the 70s. Uh, and that is now still around, even though he and his wife are dead, it's now known as Gunsight. And Jeff changed the name to Gunsight early on. Uh, but Gunsight is still one of the premier training destinations People fly in the in. nation. Oh, yeah. And a lot, of the, a lot of their classes are a week long. Oh, wow. You know, a lot of their classes, I think, they're, I think their cheapest class might be $3,000. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and they're still a premier training destination based upon what Jeff taught all of his instructors. And both Dave and Tom grew up under Jeff. Yeah. I grew up under Tom and Dave and a lot of my other mentors. So, you know, I'm, I'm once removed from Jeff Cooper. That's kind of my lineage, cool. right? Yeah. Um, so while I don't have that pedigree of being military or law enforcement or being a top level competition shooter. Yeah. I've worked with those guys and, and that's kind of my pedigree. Um, so short answer uh, to some of the long one I just gave you, uh, range master should be the bare minimum. If you ask me, if you find a range okay. master instructor, you're going to f find a good quality instructor. Nice. Um, but on top of that, like I said before, even for instructors, there isn't a destination. It's a journey. Yeah. I, I try to take 200 hours of continuing education annually. Firearm skills, maintaining my medical skills, to, to legal give people stuff. perspective. What yeah. it's, what it's like 120 hours for every four years for a medic, for a paramedic. Yeah. Yeah, 100, 120 hours every, every four, four years. years. Every four years. <laughs> and I, I strive to take 200 hours. Yeah. This because man, everybody learns differently. Are you learning something new every time? Yeah, even if it's even if I'm learning how not to do something, oh. I'm still learning something. Yeah. So I have no problem taking an entry level course because maybe I'll pick up something new from this instructor that we're teaching the same same things. Yeah. But he explained it in a way that resonated with this person. So, you know, when, when I'm teaching. I try to have like 16 different ways to explain stuff. That makes a good instructor. It's the same information, but the ability to impart that knowledge. To articulate it. To right? articulate it and yeah. to get people of different backgrounds and different learning styles to, to understand that. That was my next question. Right. Is when you started teaching or teaching open enrollment, did you ever get pushback from law enforcement or military people that were taking your classes? Uh, the ones that came to classes, no. Okay. Never got pushback from them. They're like, damn. All right. Nice, nice job, man. Right. Um, the ones that um, I got kicked back from are the ones that think that I shouldn't be teaching because I'm not military. I'm not law enforcement. So what do I know about teaching someone to fight? What do I know about teaching somebody to shoot a gun? And I just blow those guys off. They're, they're not worth the effort. <laughs> right, right, right. But unfortunately, um, their attitude does leach into the mm. firearms community. And there are students out there that think that, well, I'm never going to take a class from anybody who's not a cop or not, not military. Because what are you going to teach me? Mm -hmm. Well, my answer to that is shut up and listen. You'll learn a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> but man, I'm not going to beg you to come to a class. Yeah. You know, if I have to force you to come to a class, I don't want you as a student. That's not the type of student I want anyway. You're, you're, I, I want the people that are there with an open mind and want to learn. Yeah. You know, um, if, if you're there to show me how good you are or you're there to, there, there's nothing wrong with asking questions and questioning the instructor so you can understand it. Uh, there, there is a problem. Well, so-and-so does this better. Uh. Well, this is the right way to do it because so-and-so said so. Dude, shut up. <laughs> and, and most of the time when you get those people in class, it's really easy to shut them up. All right, man. Step up to the line. Let's do this. Here's the shot timer. Humbles them, huh? If you can perform this better than me, I'll yeah. start teaching it your way. Oh, yeah. 
yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> they, they, they never take, same they thing never in take an EMT you course. I mean, yeah. you, you get, you get firefighters that have been on the department mm. for 10 years and they've been doing the job and, but they're, you're, you're in this course for a reason because you're well, trying to become an EMT. Well, well, half of those firefighters that are in that course, and this is coming from my fire background, half those firefighters in that course because they were forced to and they don't think EMS belongs on the fire department. Oh my God. There's, it, there's it, still that these days. There's still oh, there's, that culture shift. There's absolutely still that culture in the fire department. Man, if I'm not putting wet stuff on the red stuff, <laughs> it doesn't need to be on the fire department, right? right? right. Uh, you're always going to have those people. And same, I did the same thing on the fire department. <laughs> <laughs> Go somewhere else. <laughs> uh, I'm, you. I'm I'm bored of you. Right, uh, right, right. You know, uh, sorry, we're here to stay. And the funny thing about the fire department is, you know, the EMS pays the bills. Yeah, I mean, these days, that's, that's without EMS, the, the fire department wouldn't exist. Right, 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 right. Right. That nice fancy rig you have, all that new bunker gear, all those new toys you have. Guess where that money came from? Yeah. I mean, yeah, there's grants and stuff like that, but whoosh, EMS pays yeah. the bills. Why? Because we have a billable service. We don't bill people mm. to put out fires. Shit. We bill people to take them to the hospital. Wow. So I'm, I'm your revenue stream, buddy. So <laughs> go cook my dinner. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> go put my dinner, cook my dinner. And if I can't put it out with a fire extinguisher, I'll call you. And I, I don't get me wrong. That we, we, yeah. I, 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 I love those guys, right? right. There, there's a lot of good people, right? And, and same in, same in the firearms. There, there's a lot of good people. Uh, the unfortunate thing is the, 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 the bad ones Close get the attention. Close mind and shitheads, yeah. yeah the, 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 the bad <laughs> ones get the attention and, and make the most waves. So out of all the classes that you offer, is there a favorite? My two favorite classes. Ah, there's, I'm, I'm going to go with three. Okay. Uh, we recently, um, I recently had a little bit of a, a shift in the offerings that I think is better. Uh, for the longest time, my favorite class was my "So You've Been Shot" class. Whoa! Um, yeah, because so you, you emphasize medical over over firearms. Oh, yeah. oh, absolutely. Because you can you can take it, medical knowledge wherever wherever with you, you go. Right? That medical knowledge yeah. is always with you. Yeah. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, you're more likely to use your medical skills than a firearm. Mm-hmm. That, that that's not contested. Um, so, so, so you've been shot. So you've been shot is a two day course. It's an injured shooter course. Uh, we start off with four hours of traumatic emergency casualty care in the morning, TECC, the active bystander or civilian first responder, first care provider, whatever they're calling it these days. Um, and we start with, well, if I'm going to teach you how to do medical skills with a gun, I need you to know those medical skills. Uh, so we start off the medical skills and then we go to the injured shooter stuff. Um, with the injured shooter program, uh, you, you touch your gun with two hands two maybe three times the entire class. Oh. The entire class is shot strong hand and weak hand. And we put you in compromised positions. You're shooting from the ground. You're shooting around barricades. Uh, you're running. You're moving. You're rendering aid. You know, uh, we bring out, uh, it's, it's around a $60,000 animatronic dummy, um, the, the Emmett doll um, that breeze and has pulses and you Someone can, can like talk through it uh that's the more expensive one we oh, generally don't bring that one out. that one was sixty thousand dollars <laughs> uh, i think that one's like a hundred I, I saw that at loyola for i think for that one's like a hundred the one school. that talks but i mean we can decompress the chest we can do oh, cpr okay. we can take vitals um you know it has arterial bleeds gunshots it can do blast injuries it does all sorts of stuff sucking chest wounds it's fantastic right uh so we incorporate the fighting and the medical uh, man, if, if you, if your self-defense plans around you pulling your gun and shooting someone and you think that's the end of it, uh, guess what, man, you're in for a rude awakening. Uh, <laughs> you're shooting somebody because they're trying to kill you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If you think someone trying to kill you, um, isn't going to get messy, you're lying to yourself. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. Fights are messy. I've never been in a fight where there wasn't blood involved. Never. <laughs> um, I, and I've been in lots of fights. Um, they're messy. You're going to get hit. You're going to get cut. You might get shot. You're mm-hmm. going to end up on the ground. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right? Um, you know, so medical skills are incredibly important. And knowing how to function while you're compromised is incredibly important. Um, growing off that, it's not always about a gun. Mm-hmm. Uh, you should have... A well-rounded base 
you should have some open hand skills. You should have some ground skills. You need to have medical skills. Okay. Um, it needs to be a complete package. You need mm-hmm. to be a well-rounded individual. And it's, uh, um, my friends, uh, Brian and Shelly Hill down in Georgia run the complete combatant. Mm. And it's funny. They came up with, you know, their name of their company encompasses that, you know, Brian's been a martial arts teacher forever, right? He's also a firearms instructor. They also do medical classes, right? It's an all in one package yeah. because it's not just one answer. Yeah. Right. And, and I can't give you the answer to how your self-defense scenario is going to unfold. I can guarantee you one thing. I'm not going to be there. Mm. That's the only thing I can guarantee you. Okay. Um, man, fights are messy and they go sideways really fast. Uh, and you try to simulate that in class. We, oh, we, we try to simulate that in a safe environment, you know, um, as much as we can, right? We can only do so much, right, safely. Um, but, you know, it's, you know, the, the kind of the class motto for So You've Been Shot is when shit gets wonky. Yeah. And uh, my, uh, for my course standards for that, for that course in order to earn the patch, which is Willy Wonka. <laughs> Are you serious? Willy Wonka <laughs> patch. Um, he, uh, he's been shot in the arm. <laughs> he's got a, he's got a tourniquet on. And he's shooting uh, one of my carry guns um, one-handed. That's he, he's, he's there bleeding with a tourniquet on, shooting one-handed. It is, uh, that, was done, that was made up for me by uh, uh, Lauren from uh, Drawn Fire um, Artwork. Uh, he's an excellent artist, and I just love it. Uh, it's actually one of his more popular drawings, evidently. <laughs> People always want to buy it. I'm like, sorry, man, you got to earn it. <laughs> <laughs> you can buy the picture from Lauren if you want, but the only way you're getting a patch is if you earn it. That's awesome. Um, I've only given out four patches. Oh, wow. It's an incredibly hard standard. It's, is it a new class? or just... No, no, no. It's in, it's an incredibly hard standard. I've been doing that class for a couple of years now. Oh. Um, and I've only given out four patches. Okay. Uh, and two of those, actually, they all of them went to very high-level shooters. Okay. Uh, two of them are incredibly high level shooters one uh was in in special forces for mm. almost 40 years <laughs> oh, wow. uh chuck Pressburg, he got one um and, and he squeaked in pushing the time limit i think he was like 20 he was like you have uh, 24 seconds to complete i think he squeaked in at like 22 or 23 seconds oh wow um tim heron is the only one to beat my personal best he came in at like 17 and change <laughs> wow um I can do it cold on demand in 19 seconds. I can do 17 seconds on the drill, uh, but not consistently. And Tim pulled off a 17 and can you, on can his you first sh- attempt. Share the drill again. <laughs> uh, so the drill shot at 10 yards, um, and it's shot on a 3 by 5 index card. Gun is holstered, concealed or in a duty holster. Uh, you start with the tourniquet, in your non-dominant um, pocket. Okay. And I, I, I use the pocket because, well, people carry in pockets and not everybody has a tourniquet carrier, right? Uh, if you're a, a law enforcement officer, you can have your tourniquet on your duty rig or right. on your vest, right. wherever right. you right. normally carry it. But yeah, the um, normal person, or like civilian. You know, so um, on the beep, you have to remove the tourniquet from your non-dominant side, put it on your dominant arm and you need to apply it correctly, achieving full occlusion. How do you test? Is there a way to test that? We test it after the fact. Oh, uh, we check manual oh. pulses and use a pulse ox. Right. right. Uh, obviously a Doppler is the gold standard, but, but yeah, loss a of pulse, yeah. Pulse ox. And I can't, That's feel your pulse. Right? so it has to have complete occlusion. Wow. The tourniquet has to be applied correctly. Uh, then you draw your firearm, present to target with two hands, and you have to get three shots on that. You did that in 17 seconds? Yeah. Damn. I, I call it 19. I call it 90 because that's what I can do 19. on demand. But regardless, um, like you're, you, they won't yeah. pass unless it's 24, 22? 24 seconds. 24 seconds? 24 seconds. Uh, yeah. Wow. Sorry. It's, it's, I, I haven't had enough coffee today. It's either 24 or 22. I have to check the Regardless. Paper. That's, but yeah. That's crazy. Um, okay. No, it's 24 because. Still. Um, I, 
on my bad days, I'm doing it in 20 seconds. <laughs> okay. <laughs> on my bad days, I'm doing it in 20 seconds. So I gave you four extra seconds. Okay. 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 Uh, on bad days, I'm doing it in 20 seconds. All right. Uh, most days I'm doing it at 19. Uh, so it's five seconds longer than my, this is the final week. exam yeah. of the course. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, and it's so here's the funny thing about drills. People were like, well, that's not practical. Dude, it's not supposed to be practical. Mm. Drills are meant to test your skills. Mm. Okay. Drills are not how we m actually do things in a fight always some drills yes right uh but a drill doesn't have to be done the exact same way you do it in a fight so people complain that i have people put the tourniquet on first what oh so there there is no medicine in a gunfight you need to finish the fight before that. you start rendering aid i, I understand okay? that but it was a safety issue okay if I tell people that they've got 24 seconds to do this and they have to draw and fire their gun and get three hits and then they have to safely holster their gun, grab the tourniquet and put it on, what I was going to end up with, I was going to have a bunch of dudes just slamming a gun into a gun bucket and shooting themselves. Oh. I'm not trying to use a tourniquet for real in class, right? Um, you know, so for safety, we're testing all the skills even though we're putting on the tourniquet first. I like that. But you, you Plus, also considered to say, yeah. So there's that safety aspect. Yeah. Plus, shooting a gun with a tourniquet with full occlusion oh, on. yeah. How's that? It's really hard. <laughs> <laughs> For a lot of people, it's really hard. But part of the class is also training you to fight through injuries. Yeah. You know, you get hurt and you give up. You're out of the fight. You're dead. Right. Right. right, right. You, you have to have that mindset that no matter what happens... I need to finish this fight and I need to finish it Ricky tick because otherwise I'm going to bleed to death. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, so that's kind of why we, we, we made the drill and, and structured it like that. Uh, but that's, that sounds like a fun class. That's one of my favorite classes. It absolutely is. Um, one of my favorite classes close second to that is going to be kinetic pistol from Dave Spalding. Um, one of the classes I teach because, well, man, running and gunning is fun. That's what that is? So yeah. kinetic is kinetic like moving pistol. while Movement. shooting? Yeah. Oh. yeah. We teach you how to move safely and shoot safely while on the move okay. with a firearm. Uh, it can be done inside, can but it? okay. it's not really done inside because most ranges aren't big enough. Yeah, okay. I mean, uh, we, we, got, we got people running 25 yards in that class. Oh, wow. So, you know, it's – and we need – we need a large amount of space to move, especially right. with a big group of people. That's, that sounds fun too. Right. So, um, running and gunning is just fun. Um, and, Th and those are the videos that do well on Instagram. Right. Right. <laughs> I, I just need somebody to come out and video them because uh, I'm, I'm always too busy teaching to whip out my phone. Mm -hmm. Um, that's another mark of a good instructor. It's Not, a, yeah, that's if, secondary. If, yeah. If 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 they're more interested with generating social media content, you probably don't want to be learning gun stuff from them. Yeah. Now, there's a lot of good instructors that have good social media content, but they do so with the understanding that that shit's secondary. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Students are the ones that need the attention. If I can snap a pic while they're doing it because they got it under control, I will. But you know, um, you know, so. I just don't have anybody to film it for you. Um, so uh, those are the two classes that are just really fun to do. Mm. Um, the other class that can be taken before you take any of those classes. Uh, we started doing force-on-force -force classes for people with no experience. I can elaborate on that, force-on-force. Force-on-force is... Okay, so... We have a uh, pyramid that we base our training off of. Mm -hmm. Looks like the food pyramid. Mm -hmm. The base, the biggest level, those are your essential skills. And, and I ripped this off straight from one of my mentors, Dave Spalding, because it's a great explanation of it. We call it the combative triad. Okay. Uh, on the base, uh, you have the essential skills, the mechanics of operating a gun and working the gun and hitting what you're aiming at. Uh, then you have the combative applications of it, which is the injured shooter program, mm. the kinetic pistol program, mm. uh, vehicle courses, mm. 
putting those essential skills to test in environments that make you use them not just standing on a line shooting at a target that's stationary in front of you mm -hmm. you know shooting moving targets uh combative skills and then we have the interactive aspect of it uh which is force on force training mm -hmm. instead of shooting at targets that don't shoot back you're going against a living breathing opponent that is making decisions and trying to hurt you mm. Okay. Uh, we use airsoft guns in certain locations. Uh, in this facility, we do airsoft guns because UTM guns would trash the facility. What's UTM? Uh, ultimate training munitions. Um, is that rubber bullets or something? Or uh, is it? it is a, uh, essentially it's a small paintball mm. that has a BB inside of it. Oh, wow. That, um, yeah, so you get, damage. you get marking <laughs> compliance and you get pain compliance. Ah. Um, UTM can also be a little bit intimidating for new people. Sure. So airsoft is a way to ease them into it. So, um, but we open up our, um, so you think you can carry mm. is available to anyone that owns a gun for self-defense or has a concealed carry license. Okay. Um, and we put you into scenarios with role players that, are designed in scenarios that are designed to, to you. test you. And we're, is, we're, we don't want to hurt you. No, right? no. But we are here to test your skills at their current level. And for a lot of people, it's very eye opening. Man, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. Wow. And then you get them signing up for classes because, man, I took the state mandated course. I'm good. <laughs> they said, they said I could carry and it's not that simple. Um, not only, and, and testing your skills is actually kind of secondary in that class. Mm -hmm. The primary focus of good force on force training is decision making. Mm. Yeah. Okay. You need to be able to solve the problem up here mm -hmm. before you can solve the problem out here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, it's not always a gun problem. Mm. And sometimes you know, the gun is going to cause more problems and it's going to fix. Mm -hmm. Okay. You have to be able to make good decisions with a gun and that's what it's about. And that, that's the eye opening aspect of it. It's like, man, there's a lot more that goes into this than what that state mandated course told me yeah. about. Okay. It's, I wonder how, how do we get people to, to that realization to put them in class take, and let them fail? Well, well to the realization of, I want to take this class. Um, because if it's just sitting at home, it's like when do they when do they realize that that they need more training? Talking to people, listening to people, right? We try to push them towards it, uh, but a lot of force on force is geared towards people that have a professional level of training. Mm -hmm. They are high performers. A lot of force on force is primarily geared towards professional gun people, police, Imagine military. Imagine if it was mainstream, right? Yeah. Um, and they have, okay, you have to have this minimum skill level to get into class because this is the, what we're doing, sure. right? Um, we don't have, our minimum skill level isn't nearly as high. You just need to know how the gun functions. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, and we did that purposely to open up people's eyes to drive them to the realization that they don't know as much as they think. They're not as good as they think they are. Um and it's not as simple as you think it's going to be. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, people, uh, regardless of how you learn, um, the majority of people, um, have, ha have those epiphanies when they fail. Yeah. You know, we only learn through repetitive demoralizing failure. We have to yeah. have some, to drive us to make yeah. us want to be better i heard um you should create situations where your students fail 15 percent of the time so it's not too demoralizing but it's, it, well, a, wake exactly. up, it's a wake up call exactly. right? it's, it's like you have to challenge them enough yeah but you don't want to scare them off demotivate and shut them, them. Yeah. yeah exactly yeah you don't want to shut them down okay you know um so you don't hear a lot of yelling in our classes right oh you know Barking like a drill instructor shuts mm -hmm. a lot of people down, especially adults. Yeah. Especially people who have egos in the game, right? Um, we push you. But it has to be done so in, in, in a matter that's conducive to learning. Yeah, I agree. 
right? I mean, if someone shuts down and I've lost them and it's four hours into class, uh, they're done. I'm not going to be able to reach them after that point. Yeah. So we, we have to do so in a way that is encouraging to them as well. Right, right, right. Um, are there ever any classes where it's a mix of like jujitsu and firearm? There are. Okay. Um, because of my shoulder injuries, I don't teach those classes anymore. I used to teach that stuff back before I went off the, off the fire department. Um, I used to teach martial arts. Um, I don't do that anymore. I bring in people to do that. Um, those are some force on force classes. Okay. Um, some of that is a dedicated, you know, kind of jujitsu or wrestling class or combatives mm -hmm. class with a inert blue gun. Okay. Right. Where we can introduce doing these skills with a dummy gun. Yeah. So you can roll around, do these moves, test your gear out to make sure your, your shit don't fall off. We don't have a tactical garage sale and lets you practice getting your gun out and wrestling with a gun in your hand or yeah. wrestling with a knife in your hand. Right. Uh, there, there's absolutely combative aspects of it for entangled fighting and stuff like that. Right. 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 There's absolutely aspects of that. We both probably agree that there's an opportunity within law enforcement for jujitsu to, you know, be taught. I think it should be mandatory, but why? So what's the holdup? Politics, administrations, <laughs> money, Stupid shit. And regard okay, so even put aside jujitsu, but like just to keep up with your physical training after you've gotten on the fire department or or the police department, that's not really a thing. And that being said, I've worked with laziness. Everyone who have the self discipline to do it themselves. It's just, but it's not a mandatory thing. Um, what a lot of people don't realize is that fire departments, police departments, strive for the minimum. <sighs> The majority departments strive for the minimum. These are the minimum standards that the state requires. This is all we're going to do. So if you don't have that motivation to seek out further training, whether it's gun stuff, medical stuff, combatives, you're not going to get it from the department. They're not going to give it to you. Yeah. Consider yourself lucky if you're on one of those rare departments that is proactive with their training. Cool. Yeah. Consider yourself lucky. Um, uh, one of my friends, Cato, uh, 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 Carrie Mirakami, I believe is how you pronounce it. Uh, rectitude training. Mm. I, I, just, we, I always just refer to him as Cato. <laughs> um, so I, I, I probably butchered his last name, uh, but he is a retired police officer that's here in the Chicagoland area. And he is, I believe he's a black belt. Uh, Shidokan? No. Um, uh, Brazilian, I forget. Oh, Bra is it? it's Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Okay. Uh, but his primary focus now is encouraging departments to yeah. get beyond those basics of combatives and actually get these departments doing stuff like jujitsu and entangled fighting with their officers on a regular basis. Right. Okay. Uh, and he does excellent work. Yeah. Right. Um, it's funny that in this, uh, you know, anti-gun region of the country that we're in, you know, up here in, in Northern Illinois, and we're kind of a hotbed of training. Yeah. We've got more than a handful of excellent firearms instructors. We got a bunch of yahoos, but we have some excellent local firearms trainers. And then all of these firearms trainers, you know, that I recommend and stuff like that, they all bring in other instructors and work with other instructors on a regular basis. Why? Because they realize it's not the way, it is a way. There's always something to learn, right? Mm -hmm. It's about the journey. Mm -hmm. Love that. Um, there was a recent shooting on the red line. Uh, oh, yeah, that, that, that guy's a piece of shit, and he's going to rot in jail appropriately so. He was, the only footage out there was him being pushed down. He's, he's an arm. I don't know if he was supposed to be armed. If, if the, if he the is CTA not, knew he was armed. No, he was not supposed to be armed. Exactly. Uh, CTA is a no gun zone for employees as well. Gotcha. So he was breaking the law already. Um, he was pushed down. He was pushed down. Yeah. And chasing the dude down a flight of stairs after he left and doing a mag dump into him while he posed no threat. Yeah. Dude's a murderer. 
He, if oh. he doesn't go to, I already, I already have very little faith in our justice system. Um, if he doesn't rot in jail for the rest of his life, um, I'm pretty much going to lose complete faith in the, in the local justice system. Yeah. I mean, he, that was straight up felonious murder. I mean, it was bad. Is I honestly, and that was ego. That was all ego. Oh, absolutely. It was all ego. I, do you feel like it's too easy to get a gun? No, not too easy. No. Um, I believe that we have more restrictions than we need here in Illinois. Okay. Because the restrictions that we have in place do absolutely nothing to stop criminals from getting guns. I can go anywhere on the west side and south side and get a gun in 10 minutes. Well, that's true. Yeah, I like that perspective. Okay. Um, so the restrictions that we have are excessive. Okay, Foid card needs to go away. Absolutely. It, it's just stupid. Um, the waiting period, mm. s- stupid. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't, <laughs> for both that and, and CCW, right? Uh, so, there's still a wait time for CCW. There, there is a wait time, but I, I was talking about yeah. the three day cooling off period that the state has. Oh, 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 oh for, purchasing, for, for purchasing, for purchasing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, I got a whole bunch of guns already. Yeah. That too, right? Yeah. Why, Why do I, do I to need to wait 72 hours? If I was going to do something illegal, I was just going to use one of the guns that I already have. <laughs> Valid point. <laughs> uh, I mean, <laughs> it makes sense for the for the first time buyer, I guess. right? Yeah. Um, you know, but then you get those people that come in. And... I had a guy come into the shop yesterday. He was carjacked a couple days ago. He's terrified. Oh. He's like, I need a gun, and I need training, and I need it now. Mm. Mm. Like, dude, I can get you the training, but you can't get a gun until you get your Foyd card. Months, months, yeah, right. And, and there's nothing you can do for him, right? Um, domestic abuse. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We we got a, a a lady whose husband has tried to kill her, and there's a paper trail a mile long, but she can't get a gun because she has to wait for her Foyd card, and she has to wait three days to get it. Interesting. Right? She has to wait to, for, to get her FOID card in three days to for the cooling off period of the gun after she gets her FOID card. It's crazy. Yeah. So I, I that I, I think it's unnecessary restrictions on there. Now, is it too easy for your average person to get a gun and do something stupid with it? Yes. Because there's a lot of stupid people out there. A lot of people yeah. are unsafe with firearms. Yeah. And I guess... I guess I was originally coming from the perspective yeah. of how do we filter out for people with unchecked egos or people that can just flip out. You can't. You can't. So so the the other Not side with... of the coin is to give everyone a gun. <laughs> so everyone stays right. ready. Um man, the the here's the here's the funny thing I learned about people with mental disorders, anger issues, stuff like that. People that you wouldn't want Mm -hmm. to necessarily have a gun, right? Hotheads like the dude on the CTA who because his ego was hurt when shot. There's nothing you can do because people like that are actually very good at being manipulative and gaming the system, right? Spend enough time working with psych patients and it's like, man, that dude knows the game. I mean, that dude's just straight up crazy, right? He's (laughs) he's just crazy. Then there are people that, yeah. That dude is manipulative as hell. Mm. And he knows the right answers to give. And he can hide that shit until he loses it. Work the system. and then... He can work the system. Mm. So you, you, there's no way you can tell with some of those people, right? Yeah. Um, there's nothing you can do to stop those people from getting a gun. Interesting. Right? Because they can game the system. Yeah. And if they can't game the system, they can just get a gun illegally. Right? I mean, criminals are always going to find a way to get weapons. Yeah. Always. So that being said, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you'll talk about this in the CCW class, um, but in these areas like hospitals and CTA where you're not legally allowed to carry, what does someone with a CCW do? Do you not, you can't bring it then? You can't bring it. Or, 
you can't bring it. But what if what if they were in a position where it was out of self defense? Are they still in, in legal trouble? Like, how does that work? Potentially. Wow. The potential is there. However, um, and this isn't legal advice anyway. Whoever's listening. <laughs> yes, this isn't legal advice. But so there is a legal premise of it's it's the doctrine of competing harms right mm. you got two people doing two illegal things mm-hmm. but this person while they did something illegal did so with good intent mm-hmm. okay it is illegal for me to carry into a school okay but if i'm picking up my kid from school and whatever happens that I decide it's necessary for me to go onto school property or into the school to shoot somebody. Mm. I'm breaking the law, mm-hmm. but I did so to save a life. Mm. Right? Would you domestic, be forgiven? Domestic case, you know, uh, mom's only allowed to pick up the kid dad shows up as is pissed and starts stabbing mom. And this is a known history, right? Mm. We, we don't like to interject ourselves into other people's problems without knowing the totality of the circumstances. But I know this family because I've seen them around. I know the details of it because the teachers have talked. This is, this is all what ifs, right? Dad decides that he's had enough and he's going to stab mom in front of a, in, in a school full of kids. And I break the law by entering the school and shooting him, right? Doctrine of competing harms. Yes, I broke the law, but I did so to save a life, right? There, there is a premise for that. It's not a guarantee mm. because every situation is different, but there is a premise for that. Um, if you choose to break a law, you need to understand the potential outcomes and you need to weigh the risks mm. and make a decision, understanding what could possibly happen to you. Gotcha. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Um, that I know of, there's been nobody been um, convicted oh. in Illinois of taking a gun into one of those places and they used it. Gotcha. Okay. Um, there's been shootings on the CTA red line from uh, legal concealed carriers. They haven't been prosecuted. There's been okay. people who have used AR-15 rifles in the city of Chicago to defend themselves. Illegal. <laughs> but they weren't prosecuted because they legally own the firearm. They just can't legally possess it in the city, right? So they don't have it illegally, you know? Um, so while they broke the, the, the city ordinance, they were lawful in their actions. Mm. They were justified in using force to defend, not prosecute, right? Yeah. Uh, there's, ton, I don't know of a single person who has been convicted of breaking the law as long as they were justified in the defensive use. Interesting. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, part of that is, you know, there, there is those premises, those precedents set within our legal system, but also part of that is lawyers like to win. Lawyers generally don't choose to take a losing case. Mm. (laughs) So if they know they can't win it, they're not going to prosecute you. Um, and if they do prosecute you and they lose, then it sets precedent that, you know, so like, um, I'm a firm believer that Kim Fox will never prosecute anybody for carrying a gun on public transportation Mm. because it's a loser of a case. Because if they prosecute this person for using a gun to defend themselves in a gun-free zone, Mm -hmm. it proves the need and sets a precedent to have guns legally. So now... What if that gets the ball rolling? Right? So so now, (laughs) now, now we have... Precedents. Precedents yeah. to eliminate gun-free zones. Gun-free zones are dangerous. <laughs> right? So that, doesn't stop the bad guys. Right? Yeah. It doesn't stop the bad guys. No. Right? So 
it's going to set a precedence and they're going to end up having to give up stuff that they don't want to give up. So they're going to choose not to prosecute it. Yeah. And that's just my feelings on it. I'm not a lawyer, but you know, <laughs> what, what if, I don't know, this is, this, this is probably very controversial, but like just as common as foreign languages are in high school, what if firearm instruction was an elective in high school? I absolutely think it should be. <sighs> absolutely think it should be. Um, as, as, you, as you said earlier, and it's a feeling of mine, um, the more education we have on something, the better. Uh, we would have less accidents with children and guns if we started them earlier in life and we uh, eliminated that curiosity and it was a normal aspect yeah. of their lives not a big deal. instead of yeah. being taboo. Right, just like drinking. Just like drinking. Right. Right? Um, I was allowed to drink when I was a kid. <laughs> You know, and you don't you don't make a big deal out of it. It eliminated the taboo, yeah, right? right? Same thing with you know, you teach them the proper way to do it, and make it a normal thing, mm-hmm. and all of a sudden that desire to sneak, yeah, or play with it or experiment is gone, right? Right. Um, so I absolutely believe that there should be firearms education in schools. Awesome. Uh, the same reason I believe there should be sex education in schools. Yeah. They're, they're, you know, right? Um, how do you keep kids from getting pregnant? Show them how not to and explain all yeah. the pros and cons, right? This is something that is good for adults, but something that can have devastating effects on your life as a child. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, well, we just preach abstinence. Man... <laughs> That shit don't work. Just like manual gun take, safety. Take, take something away from someone. That, that's right? all they're going to think about. Right? Right. You know, um, you know, just like manual gun safeties don't keep kids from making guns go bang. Kids mm. are smart. Kids are curious. They're going to figure that shit out, right? So you teach them and you demystify it, right? Kids are going to have sex. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay? Mm-hmm. It, you know, teach them the right way, the safe way to do it, and you're going to be better off. Yeah. So it's the same thing with guns, man. Right? Yeah. It's the same 100%. thing with guns. hundred percent. Um, that's all I had all right, hey, for now. Hey, maybe, no, that's maybe good for a future, but that was an absolute pleasure of an episode. Where can people find you if, uh, they're, if you want to be found and if they're looking. All right. So, um, archetype of the gun.com, mm-hmm. uh, archetype of the gun on, uh, Facebook, archetype of the gun on Instagram. Um, mm-hmm. That's the best way to find me. Okay. Um, all of our contact information is on the website. Uh, all of our class schedules on the website. I'm a little bit lax right now in putting our classes on Facebook, uh, partially because I don't have the time right now, and partially because I didn't get a lot of traction from the Facebook. The majority of my website. I, I, I saw an ad by, I don't know, maybe they're listening to me listening to your last episode, but for chai shooters. <laughs> Oh, oh, yeah. Okay. I was hit yeah. with an ad for that on Facebook. Right. I was like, how did they know? I was like, <laughs> right, right. You know, so um, schedule is always going to be on the website. You can right. also find yeah. it, you know, um, all the stuff we do here at Shore Galleries. You yeah. can find that on the Shore Galleries website. Yeah, Lincolnwood, um, Illinois. Yep, in Lincolnwood here, just literally across the street from Chicago. We're the closest gun range to Chicago. I honestly thought I'd have to go to the south suburbs uh, yeah. for something, and yeah. uh, and then someone mentioned Shore Galleries. So. Yep. We're, yes. we're, we're, we are the closest range to the city of Chicago because we are literally across the street. Okay. Well, we're yeah. just unfortunately on the north side. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. You right. know, um, so uh, th- those are the ways to find me. Thanks, Eric. Yep. Uh, I'm looking forward to future classes. Um, and for those listening, I'll see you guys in the next one. Hey, thank you very much, Victor.